I never should have made it to Afghanistan. As a student of international and terrorism studies, I had always wanted to go, but it was never really supposed to happen. Because even though what I studied lent itself to government, I never seemed able to find the right place, apply at the right time, or, quite frankly, be the right person. Until suddenly, oddly, someone thought I was. My qualifications to work in Kabul were sufficient, but they hardly compared to the outstanding accomplishments of my subject matter expert colleagues. What I lacked in skill, I harbored an enthusiasm for the mission, to train, advise, and assist Afghans. So there I was. I showed up with big ears and eyes and believing in winning without knowing, like most, unfortunately, what it takes to win. For the first seven months, I trained the trainer, instructing coalition advisors, who in turn assisted Afghan civilians, police, and military members. Over time, though, my hopefulness faded, and I found a sad home in doubt and distrust. By chance, I crossed paths with the former governance and rule of law advisor to five previous four-star ISAF commanders. With his mentorship, I learned a great deal. I sharpened my ability to discern, and I began to deal in realism. For the next nine months, I worked off base directly with Afghans. In the end, I came away with cautious optimism for Afghanistan and a real sense and appreciation for pragmatism when it comes to making a difference. Bearing in mind that today is about ideas that challenge us, I'd like to share one with you that I would have countered with gusto just a few short years ago. No, no, I would have told you. That's not how it works. Any help is better than no help. Now I know. There are wrong ways to help. My shift in perspective came with those 16 formative months in Afghanistan, where I saw that sometimes it's better not to help at all than to do so unwisely. Challenging though it would be, there are no answers for how to fix Afghanistan today. That's not why we're here. Instead, I have three theories about how to help one another and how not to help one another, whether as states, communities, or neighbors. What we need to be better at together is recognizing when the help we give is not wanted or working, because there is value in stopping, not repeating, that which consistently fails, help that fails to make a positive change. My first theory is that bigger is not better, nor is more. Only in some cases can success be had by blanketing a problem with large sums of money and an influx of people. Looking back, Great Britain's 18th and 19th century exploits in Afghanistan were mixed, but the imperial model overall usually resulted in growth for its colonies. And one of the reasons for this success was because Great Britain deployed a smaller footprint of highly qualified individuals willing and able to sustain the mission in one place for years on end, if not their lives. The model of the model, if you will, was a man named Alexander Burns. Flawed in some respects, but deeply talented in most others. Burns was the kingdom's brightest political officer to Afghanistan in the 1800s. That, that's because he, he took it upon himself to live among the people. He learned the language and he spoke it fluently. He knew the culture intimately. He wrote prolifically about his travel and experiences, and his copious notes went on to better explain Afghan peoples, tribes, and ways of life, and they are still referenced today. Burns was much like Lawrence of Arabia, both of them career British statesmen in one place. They didn't just balance the books. They were there to ensure that colonial governance functioned smoothly day to day, and their approach was anthropologist-like because they were patient and happy to live with, like, the people. This made all the difference. Fast forward to late 2001, to the West arrival in Afghanistan. Since then, in 15 years, literally millions of foreigners have rotated in and then rotated back out. This modern revolving door of personnel strains the crucial cultural element needed in Afghanistan above all else, and that's trust. In counterinsurgency, clear, hold, build, 
depends as much on human capital as it does on financial capital, and both can be misused. I would argue, controversial though it may be, perhaps people should be screened before they go to execute the strategy. Do they really care about winning hearts and minds? In my time as a trainer in Kabul, I met more than a few who did not care. Once, while leading a session on Afghan culture and the importance of greeting one another, greeting their counterparts in Dari, the local language, a DOD civilian rolled her eyes and interjected, why should we say hello to them? What have they ever done for us? I was shocked. Mostly I was discouraged. The mission is to help Afghans in Afghanistan. If you cannot bring yourself to say hello, what are you doing here? It made me wonder. Money-wise, millions of dollars are spent per hour in Afghanistan. A great many things have been done with this amount, though not without error. Issues began when, instead of asking how much to borrow this land, often the modus operandi was to transfer cash. When additional space was needed at a later time or in another space, there was less maneuverability to negotiate. The West's habit of paying exorbitant sums in a country with as staggering poverty as Afghanistan, it went on to limit our long-term sustainability, influence expectations on both sides, and affect their culture. Always problematic in Afghanistan is a penchant for graft. Tidal waves of money made it worse. Corruption has been deemed the most significant threat to stability in Afghanistan. Two examples spring to mind here. One quite big and well known, the other less so, but more prevalent. First, Kabul Bank was new to the development scene in the early 2000s. By 2010, just under $1 billion had been swindled from its depositors by the Afghan elite. Second, an Afghan military commander, part of a training facility, agreed to build a separation barrier between male and female barracks because the women were being harassed. This was a project to be done with foreign funds. When the money was allocated, he took it and he built himself a personal pool. People are an investment when it comes to helping others, especially in Afghanistan, where there is nothing without trust. What would it be like to scale down the mission, go back to those willing and able to live, work among Afghans for the long haul? I think there would be value in that old-fashioned diplomacy. It would cost less, there would be less opportunity to steal, and I bet there's a strong chance that Afghans would enjoy more stability than they do now. My second theory is that change is restricted when change is forced. During the Taliban, there were no women's rights in Afghanistan. Afghanistan still ranks among the lowest in the world at gender equality and integration. In March 2015, a young woman named Farhunda was violently killed by a mob in downtown Kabul. President Ghani promised justice when, in reality, the lawyer representing the victim's family was quietly asked to step down from the highest levels of government. Judicial proceedings for the men, and some women actually, who beat Farhunda, who ran her over and dragged her by car and then lit her body on fire were appalling. There were hundreds in that crowd. Only 49 were accused, less than half were formally charged, and every sentence was later reduced. Unfortunately, to many conservative Afghans, women just do not have the same rights or worth as men. Even so, there is concentrated effort by the West for Afghanistan to incorporate women into its national security apparatus. In order to do that, Afghanistan has agreed to implement international law in the form of a UN Security Council resolution that enables women to participate in post-conflict reconstruction. Now, there are some who genuinely want and actively strive toward gender integration in Afghanistan, but this decidedly new initiative is not as idealistic as one would hope. In fact, it's bolstered in large part by substantial financial incentive, as seen in the last case of that missing separation barrier. 
Afghan women are primarily seen as wives and mothers and often physically separated from men who are not family. To include women in uniform, like men, with men, makes for a sudden switch. It's presumptuous for foreigners to come in and announce, we have women in our armed forces, so should you. That's misrepresentative of real change, I think. Real change is not that easy, and here's why. In 2010, the Afghan government set a real ambitious goal. We want 10% of the national defense and security forces to be women in 10 years. Five years into that goal, 0.5% of the army was women, and 1.5% of the police was women. They have since gone back to the drawing board on that to find a goal that is more feasible for Afghanistan. At the highest levels of government, there is support for gender integration. At the micro level, sharing authority with women is not popular. As a consequence, Afghan service women have serious complaints, passed over for promotion, no facilities, verbal harassment, abuse, threats. Hearing about the challenges of Afghan service women directly from Afghan service women got me thinking, and it got to me mostly. What if this kind of push for this kind of gender integration, admirable though it is, is too much too soon? If there is more harm than good in action right now, maybe there is more good than harm and utility in old-fashioned conversation. Think of it like ink blotting. One conversation is one dot. Over time, that dot gains traction a little bit by itself, but once it hits other dots of ink, it grows. It becomes a blot. In order to have women in the, in the services in Afghanistan, there's a prerequisite. A woman cannot sign up by herself. She has to have the permission of her father, brother, or her husband. That's why this is called gender integration, both of them. That's why it's important to create that exposure first. If you're going to have Afghan women serving their country, perhaps having weapons, this is a drastically different thing. You need to talk about it first. Ergo, the value of all-encompassing conversation, whereby you introduce an idea to a people before that idea simply manifests itself before people can accept it. My third theory is that there are cultural limits to what is possible and that this is actually okay. Being a new person in a new place is about being aware. Who is in the same space? How do they interact? This takes a lot of looking and listening because as a change agent, you're expected to fit into that setting. You are expected to respect that culture and adapt to it as best as you can. Regrettably, many change agents show up and ask, what are my goals according to what I know? When the wiser question is, what are realistic goals according to the host audience and their culture? Some years ago, there were reports that coalition personnel working with a village without local access to water built a well in that village to help. It seemed logical. It was part of counterinsurgency strategy to assist rural villages. Later, when coalition personnel returned, they found the well destroyed. Those of you who have seen Tina Fey in Whiskey Tango Foxtrot may already be familiar. Now, the reports, they suggested that village women were to blame because they couldn't walk and talk on their way to get water. Had a woman been involved in this, an Afghan woman been involved in the decision making, maybe the outcome would have been different. I would argue that's, that's probably a measure that's too much too soon for Afghanistan and for conservative rural areas, which accounts for 80% of the population. Had someone been present, someone else, a foreigner maybe, who knew more about Afghan women and village culture, we could have avoided the security risk, for one, and we could have saved money spent on an unwanted well. To be a respected change agent, you have to know an audience so well as to know what goals are appropriate, what goals will challenge their culture, but also drive it forward. In a quiet way, you have to be willing to guide that audience, many people at one time, toward and through that goal with confidence. 
It takes a lot of looking and listening and adapting because they're not going to adapt to you. It's on you as the guest to adapt. And there are entirely too many change agents who don't. But that's what's expected of you. You have to know when to improvise, when to modify your goal, when to scrap it and start completely from scratch or do more research. In April 2015, after that conference, I got a chance to visit a Kabul orphanage. And in our multiple convoys, we carried monster-sized boxes brimming with different kinds of toys. The children, all 88 of them, were overjoyed to see us and us them. And then they saw the toys. And then chaos. Because they had nothing, they wanted everything. We were so looking forward to going there, to meeting them, to seeing young people, giving them something we thought they would like. But we hadn't coordinated our gift with the orphanage staff. So we didn't know and we didn't think that bringing toys would also bring mayhem. Two months later, we packed 88 mostly the same school kits. The boys and girls were happy. We were happy. It was simple. It worked. Changing course with the kids was a reminder that big, go big, this, this does not always apply. And I know we like to apply it, but it doesn't work all the time. It's a reminder that forced change tends to be inadequate. And it's a reminder that there are assistance goals. Somehow, I made it to Afghanistan. And what I learned and internalized is that there are many ways people can make change and help, not all of which are effective or appropriate. For instance, you can blast rock to radically alter a landscape. Or you can learn to control explosions, as in the kinds inside our car engines that propel us and others forward. Making and managing those bursts of change among people takes profound dedication. Helping Afghanistan it's the macro version of helping others, where the micro rule still applies. Help others for the sake of helping them. What Plato would describe as truly noble and morally right, the only real reason to give help. Helping others for the sake of helping them forces us, you or I as a system, as change agents, to be more deliberate. And if that's not our reason, it's likely the wrong way to help from the get-go, and that's a problem for the change agent, not the audience. A slower, old-fashioned road may very well lead us to more valuable ways to inspire others to create and control those bursts of change for themselves and not be afraid of it. That's when help is right and when lasting change is possible. Thank you.